Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. Let me read you what I wrote uh, over the previous weekend, because I bunked off last weekend. I was enjoying myself so much on the beach, but uh, I wrote this on the 10th of August, the end is nigh. Many years ago, and when I was a boarder at Westminster School, I used to like wandering the streets of central London on the weekend. My typical circuit would pass by 10 Downing Street, Trafalgar Square, St James's and Green Park, and I would oftentimes end up at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park. Speaker's Corner was a place where anyone could stand up and speak about anything they chose. I'm talking about a period when the then Ayatollah Khomeini was upending the Peacock Throne, when Mrs Thatcher was upending the Labour Party, and Blondie was top of the charts. The curious thing about these Sunday meanderings around London was that I would always come across a fellow, a walking billboard, you know, that board they have on the front and the back, normally advertising a restaurant, and typically in New York, as it were, on the front and the back, would be written, the end is nigh. It was like a Paul Houston, I would see him in Trafalgar Square, then he might pop up at Speaker's Corner, and once even in the cloisters of Westminster Abbey. This kind of thing can unhinge a teenager. It's certainly the reason I put it under macro thoughts is uh, we've got some pretty unhinged things happening in the markets. Let's start off with Richard Frost, who tweeted, When currency pegs go, Kazakhstan's tenge plunged by 23% in a shift of free float. This is basically the inevitability of the oil price decline and how you can't forever, like Emma Fila in Nigeria, have your finger in the dike and think you're going to get away with it. You're going to get blown away by a tsunami, Mr. Emma Fila. The devaluation of the one could have long-lasting effects in Africa. This is interesting as well. So from what we know, the trade between China and Africa continent-wide was $220 billion in 2014. That's three times the US level. Talk about what they are trading. For the most part, trade going from Africa into China has been raw materials, iron, copper, crude oil, platinum, and a number of other commodities. Few countries, for example, South Africa, Mauritius, Ethiopia more recently, have been exporting finished products. South Africans have been big on trying to get the Chinese middle class to drink their wine, and in Ethiopia they're trying to get the Chinese to wear their shoes. Um, so raw materials to China, China was building up infrastructure in Africa as well, help us understand what this devaluing in the currency, in the Chinese currency, means for all this. The most immediate impact of devaluation is that it's going to change the relationship for trade. Chinese exports are going to become cheaper and imports into China are going to become more expensive. So for any of China's trading partners this means that their imports into China are going to drop and they're also going to find it cheaper to import from China. So they're probably going to import more and export less. So for everybody else, this is going to be something they're going to have to adjust to. Important point, particularly for Africa. Home thoughts, uh, Hannah just loved her visit to Diani. Um, she had a blast and actually, you know, the waves were much higher than you normally expect. Uh, we kept getting warnings from anyone walking by the beach, don't let the children in there. And, uh, you know, she had three day afternoons in a row when she shouldn't have been in there, but she was. She was a pretty good swimmer, and I could see it was quite shallow. And uh, I was right there, frankly. Um, but she loved it and had all, it was all this excitement. Let me put up this photograph. You can see the silhouette of my brother, Samir, and Hannah's in the water. And yesterday she told me that really yesterday was the most boring day of her life. And, uh, you know, and I understood how much she'd enjoyed herself. And I said to her, we should be getting down there more. There's nothing better than the sea breeze, fresh seafood, your kids swimming and exercising and all that kind of thing. I love the coconuts and Omari. We were there three years ago in the same place. And uh, Omari remembered me and they're extremely sweet. George Santayana, who seems to have gotten inside my head of late, an artist is a dreamer consenting to dream of the actual world. And then history is a pack of lies about events that never happened told by people who weren't there. History is always written wrong, 
and so always needs to be rewritten. Sirikoi Lodge tweeted something this morning. Sometimes, oh, it was a few days back. Sometimes nature sets up everything so perfectly. It's a photograph of rhinos at sunset. If you haven't seen my interview with William Roberts, Willie Roberts, he is the founder, him and his wife, of Sirikoi, where we stayed and had a wonderful time. And listen to his journey. They were far away in Lake Beringo. And, you know, that's a remote place, frankly. And you're, we're talking 50 years ago now, 60 years ago even. And uh, it's a journey of, of Willie, all the way from there to Lewa, where he is now, and in Surakoi. And uh, I did a little interview, and do take a look. And then uh, I like this tweet this morning. Shall we dance? The blue-necked ostrich displays for his mate and hopes she will reciprocate. Don't we all? Political reflection, supreme excellence, consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. As it currently stands, this is a sentence in an article I read earlier, the US is the only current country currently engaging in hybrid war. And really, at the apex of the US, and I think it's no small credit to President Obama, he's a sophisticated mind, an oil hybrid warfare specialist, and he has taken Putin to the cleaners. Russia has only tangentially recognized this new development in May 2014 at the Moscow Conference on International Security. They haven't understood it. Associated Press reporting this morning, South Korean Defense Ministry says rival Korea's trading artillery fire on their border. That could flash up at any moment. Andrew Green tweeted, U.S. says Kia will sign peace deal. Apparently, U.S. is so fed up with South Sudan now making announcements for them. I would. Goodness. I mean, I think the, the behavior of South really disqualifies him from a leadership position. Joanne Marina, sudden announcement that President Kronzinza will be sworn in today for his controversial third term. And then from some following tweets, one from Iwaku, Burundi Pretestation du Sarmont to President de la Republique, and apparently the ambassadors of Egypt and Russia which is interesting, and also further more interesting, President Dos Santos of Angola rocked up as well. So think about that. I found this tweet, um, Electronic Resistance, Zabadani Victories Near Nasrallah, Assad, Syria, Hezbollah, and it's like a 29 second clip. Have a look at it. And uh, I retweeted it, and, uh, said digital information warfare is the new normal. And, uh, it really is. Listen to that video and it took me back to that piece I quoted in September 2012, which I still think is deeply profound. And I keep repeating it. One of the defining bifurcations of the future will be the conflict between information masters and information victims. And I said, you know, um, information warfare, this is now uh, a U.S. staff sergeant writing in 1997. Information warfare will not be couched in the rationale of geopolitics, the author suggests, but will be spawned like any Hollywood drama out of raw emotions, hatred, jealousy, greed, emotions rather than strategy, will set the terms of information warfare. So I'll put up a photograph of Bashar and Asma. I'm sure the date of this photograph, they never imagined what was about to engulf them. Dollar loses its edge on Fed minutes. So Minutes from last month's Fed monetary policy meeting showed officials in broad agreement that the U.S. economy was nearing the point where interest rates should move higher, but they noted lagging inflation, weak global economy, posed too big a risk to commit to liftoff, leading some investors to question the likelihood of a rate hike in September. And uh, U.S. Treasury yields fell, money market futures rolled back expectations of a rate rise in September tenure, it's now at 2.122%, having declined from an eight-month high of 2.5% in June. Dollar lost some of its edge, fell to a three-week low of 123.68 to the yen. Um, and one, uh, it's now above uh, 111.40 area when I checked last. Uh, 
gold also spiked higher. I'll come to that. So market now repricing expectations of a rate hike. And I think given the volatility we've seen in China, in particular in concerns, out of there, I think they're going to skip September, actually. Let's go to the currency markets. 111.40 euro dollar, dollar index 96.50 yen, 123.91 way markets position we could see a further sell off in the dollar swissy 0.9639 um, pound 156.21 aussie back below 73 at 0.7286 in rupee 65.395 south korean one 11.8982 brazilian real 349.05 egyptian pound 782.50 and the rand uh, last time i heard it just popped its head above 13 for the first time since 2000 one. Let me put up a three-month chart of the dollar index. I think this can pull back a little in the short term. Euro dollar, I'll put up a three-month chart that can probably push on a little bit higher in the near term. Um, commodity markets, you will recall on the 3rd of November, I said the commodity super cycle is dead in the water. Um, Glencore CEO says China is a lot weaker than anyone expected at the moment. None of us can read China, said the 58-year-old South African. None of us know what is going on there, and I'm yet to find the guy who can predict China correctly. China in the first half was a lot weaker than anyone expected. And it was interesting, I was having lunch with somebody yesterday, and they said to me, China reminds them of the USSR, and it looked invincible and very strong. That was just before it broke up. Uh, it's an interesting point. Gold, 11.37. I said the rebound could get as high as 11.50. Um, let's keep an eye on that. Crude oil, I take you back to October 2013 when I put out a $75 call on, on oil. Um, uh, at that time, we were trading around $97.85. Uh, 23rd of March, I said I expect a sharp slide below $40 a barrel. 10th of August, I said the end is nigh for crude oil and oil producers from Caracas to Luanda, from Riyadh to Abuja, I forgot to mention Kazakhstan. Um, and on the 10th of August, I also said oil is now in free fall. I said the end is nigh for the oil-based rentier economies. President Obama, first Kenyan-American president of the United States, an oil warfare specialist, has scored the equivalent of a hat-trick of the world in how he has advanced the U.S. national interest by using the price of oil as a geopolitical spear. Oil-based economies are going to contract. Currencies which have already collapsed are going to be routed. And Greek-style austerity will be the order of the day. The meltdown is coming. I quoted Kapuczynski, if the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. I said the revolution is only just beginning. Holger tweeted crude crashes to a six and a half year low on unexpected crude oil build flirts with forty dollars a barrel i always like his charts they're very visual the interesting point about crude oil now is forward crude so we're at like 40 41 dollars in the spot market we are at only 20 dollars premium all the way to 2020 that is a very interesting situation i'll put up a three-month chart for that as well fell 4% on Wednesday. Um, uh, a break below 40 will send us straight to 30. Point of fact, biggest diamonds are resisting the price drop in the press pressure stains. The biggest diamonds are holding their value as smaller gems slump, according to the miner. Uh, this is Gem Diamonds Limited. Um, and uh, on that note, uh, it's only down 3%, everything else is down nearly 30%. A 76.41 carat flawless diamond cut from the 15th largest diamond, 603 carats uh, in the world, called the Lesotho Promise, found at Let's Sing Diamond Mine. Pretty impressive. Let's go to Africa. Salva Kiir's refusal to sign a deal to end an 18 month civil war was mind boggling, said the chief mediator. He said the UN and the African Union would be asked to take over if Mr. Kiir failed to sign in 15 days. Let's see what pans out there. Soma Oil and Gas is requesting a meeting with the UN over Somalia allegations. South African retailer Massmart forecasts a sharp decline in half year profit on Wednesday, hurt by unfavorable currency moves, putting its shares on course for their biggest one day slump in more than 15 years. Um, uh, 
and that's interesting when you contextualize that South Africa's retail sales grew by 3.5% year on year in June. NASPAS is in talks with wireless carrier Vodacom about delivering video content to mobile devices across Africa. That's going to be big. NASPAS and uh, DSTV, and if they can get 90 second Eng English Premier League bite sized content delivered practically in real time, I think they'll just feel that they will just go nuts because Africa's so keen on football. South African All Share got hammered yesterday down 1.64%. It's now only up 0.43% this year. A dollar rand now trading over 13. Remember my 14 target was, was quite extreme when I put it out there. The Egyptian stock market got hammered down 2.13% yesterday. Year to date down 18.88%. We're now at 20 month lows and it has really gotten clobbered of late. Nigerian all share is down 13.31%. Year to date, I think it's going lower. Ghana Stock Exchange down 4.688%. I'm very bearish about Nigeria. I think all this optimism, um, uh, and everyone's got excited, but you know, I think Mr. Buhari, President Buhari, is moving very slowly at a snail's pace. INM Holdings here in Kenya reported first half profit after tax accelerated 29.54%. Total assets up to 189.3 billion. Um, <coughs> first half profit before tax up 27.42%, first half EPS up 31.39%. They have an interesting geographical spread, they're in Rwanda, Tanzania and in Mauritius. And they have a lower base effect which probably supports the shape of the earnings trajectory for more than 24 months. In my view, it looks a cheap share on a forward price earnings ratio basis. NIC Bank reported first half profit after tax accelerated 9.8%. Total assets up 18.2%, loans and advances to customers up 18.3%. Operating expenses surged to 33.2%, however, profit before income tax up 10.4%, earnings per share up 2.3%, um, trades on a P of less than 7, and I think uh, there's room for upside there. Nation FM tweeted ODM asks Kenyans to boycott milk products, Brookside produced by Brookside to protest the Kenya-Uganda sugar deal. We're watching this closely and in real time because it's very interesting to see how you know this plays out. Kenya Shilling, uh, week 103.50. Last time I had a look, Nairobi All Share down 7.29% year to date, down 0.41% yesterday. NSE 20 down 12.67% year to date, down 0.39% yesterday. Cargo handled at the port, Mombasa port, up 14%, 13.2 million tons. Um, yesterday, uh, the market obviously eased back, uh, but remains above the 5th of August lows for both all share and NSE 20 indices. There's been a very strong performance in the agricultural uh, segment of the market this year. It's been an outperformer, Limuruti, you know, about which I spoke yesterday. Results should have been better frankly, um, but it's very much a real estate play. If you know Nairobi, Limuruti estate sits right in the sweet spot of uh, appreciation. It's on the outskirts of Nairobi. It's gone up considerably in terms of land prices. And uh, if they do what Sassini did, which was book uh, some land sales through the accounts, um, uh, you know, they too will uh, you'll see a further sharp rally in that share price. Uh, Sassini T is up 37% this year, Limuru T uh, is up 40.7%. Safaricom was strong, up 1.01% to close at 15. Three buyers for every seller. This is ahead of um, book closure for the dividend. Kenya Airways has seen some really high volume action of late. Rallied 1.66% yesterday, to close at 610, traded as high as 645, up 7.5%. Traded 7.376 million shares yesterday, uh, making that a total of 13.788 million in the last two sessions. Way above the daily volume moving average, there's been a relentless buyer at work. Uh, the stock has rebounded 16.39% since the 5th of August and to within 8.95% of the price in the market the day before the full year earnings release. It's a noteworthy move. Uchumi firm 0.68% closed at 740, but was trading at 8 plus 8.84% at the finish.
This is yesterday again. KCB ticked lower on a trailing P/E ratio of 8.25, and having accelerated first half earnings, profit after tax 13%. It looks cheap to me. NSE 20 up 1.25%. These are salad days for the folks up the road, of course. You know they're absolutely correlated to volumes, and volumes have gone ballistic. And uh, otherwise, if you ever want to follow the stock market in real time, and it's trading now, for example, just register on rich.co.ke, get a password, and then click onto Rich Live. And the two boards, the normal board, will give you the whole story, bid, offer, latest price, volumes. And the expert board, you can dig into a single share if you want to look at the supply, demand, last trades, graphs, the fundamentals, etc. So it's free. Once again, thank you for stopping by.